my units in this problem. Do you remember? Of distance. What did they give? It wasn't meters. It was centimeters. So although it's centimeters and we're like, oh, they're all the same, we need to convert to meters. So this is technically like zero. This is 0 0.075. And this is 0 0.11. Is that clear in meters? Okay, two decimal spots. Now, with that said, I should also know my charges. Charge one was negative. I'll put the value down in a minute. Charge two was positive, and charge three was negative. And the question said, what are the direction and magnitude of the total force exerted on charge one? On charge one. If it's on charge one, what does that mean? If it's on charge one, what did I tell you about? Yeah. It would be one, two, and one, three. Remember, the first subscript is the object of interest. What else did I say? If object one is the one that we care about, what do we assume? That it's the only one that moves. Good. Well done, Brandon. Object one is the only one that could move, really. Object two and three, it must be stationary. So, which way would object one move? And if you need to do this on the test, do it. Here, do this, what I'm showing. Cover it up and say to yourself, where would object one move if only object two were there? Would it get pulled to the right or pushed to the left? Why? Because it's positive and attractive. Good. Positive, negative, or attractive. So this would get attracted to Q2. Because Q2 can't move, remember. Then I cover this up, and I say to myself, how would object one move as a response to object three? It would get pushed away, because opposite up, likes repel. The same sign <coughs> repels. So when I draw my free body diagram for object number one in this arrangement, I need to recognize that it's getting pushed and pulled. It's getting pushed to the left, like we just said, by object three. Force on one from three and it's getting pulled to the right by object two. Force on one from object two. So that's how I begin with my free body diagram. That's how I begin with my free body diagram. I'm gonna tell you now, you will get a point out of five if you get the free body diagram right alone. I'm gonna make this, or four points, whatever it's worth. The first part will say, draw a free body diagram. If you don't, you will not get full credit. Even if you miraculously get the answer right because you're just adding and subtracting luckily through, sure, you'll get four, but you won't get the fifth point. You follow what I'm getting at? Show the free body diagram. Now, how do I calculate F12 and F13? There. Uh, maybe like nine times 10 to the nine times. Uh, Good. KC? Seven, no, wait, oh, seven, five times 10 to the negative six. And then point one one times 10 to the negative six. So those aren't the charges, remember. Those are the distances. Be careful. Those are distances. Oh, and then you divide all that by... Those are all the distances. But, uh, Darren, what I meant is more general. I wanted a more general answer, Darren. So what's my formula for F12 is what I'm saying, Darren. What would I use? Q what? Q1. Um, and? And Q2. All over? All over R squared. What's the R subscript give me, though? Remember I did this? I want the R value as the distance between... Very good. It's important to put a subscript because it signifies the gap that you're looking at. So when I look at the gap between particles 1 and 3, I notice that it's 11, but particles 1 and or 0.11. But the gap between particles 1 and 2 is 0.075. So we need to specify what R is, if it's R12, R13, R23, R21, whatever it may be. Now, what else did I tell you to do? Because the free body diagram already indicates left or right. Well done, Joe. I'm looking at the magnitude of this force only. So I get the magnitude, and then that number I get, whatever it may be, goes in right there for F12. Is that clear? And therefore, it becomes a push to the right, or a positive force. And then F13 is going to be what kind of a force? A negative force, because F13 is to the left. Now, if I want to find F13, I do the same thing, but instead of using Q1 and Q2, I use, yeah. 
And instead of the distance between 1 and 2, and then I get a number. Now, I can get those numbers, and we can do that. So we can show that math real quick. But if I want to find the overall force acting on particle 1, my final step is to do the sum of the forces. And it's F12 minus F13. And where does F12 minus F13 come from? It comes from the fact that F12 is positive, that's to the right, and F13 is negative, that's to the left. What yes? Then you just add them together. Okay. If it was F12 and F13 both drawn to the right, it's F12 plus F13. Then why is it F12 minus F13? Look at the free body diagram. Whichever way the arrow is drawn, the negative or positive gets attached specifically. All right. Now, one thing to point out, this problem was given in microcoulombs. So let's discuss that so we know. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit and move this over so we can put it on the right. So we have Q1 in this problem given as... And I'm going to put negative for it, but again, I'm going to put the positive when I use it. Negative 2.1 microcoulombs. But micro means what again? Times the number of six power. Good. And by doing this enough, it's just second nature at this point. You don't even really memorize it. You just kind of know it. What's the other type of prefix you saw? Nano. Or that, good, nano. nano. Nice, good job. And nano coulombs are 10 to the negative 9. So those are two prefixes you're going to want to know for chapter 19. Is that clear what I'm saying? Yeah? Okay. Good. And then the R, you just make sure when you're using R, R12 is this gap right here, which is the gap from there to there. So R12 is really 0 0.075. And then R13 would be 0 0.11. Hey, how would I find R23? I don't need it right now. I get it. I get it. But what if I did need R23, Darren? It's uh, 0.11 minus 7.5. Yeah, it's the, I got you. It's the difference between the two. So if this is at 11 centimeters and this is at 7.5, what's the gap between these? Just subtract the two. So 11 minus 7.5 would give me, in this case, 3.5. So this would be 0 0.035. The difference between those two positions is what gives me the gap that I have between the particles. Good. Um, all right, I'm going to stop that problem there because the rest you can definitely do. What do you got? So, yes, good. Q1 mm -hmm. is zero, so wouldn't it just be zero over? Q1 is not zero. Q1 is 2.1 microcoulombs. It's right there on the top right. It's given in the book. Read the book. Read the question. Q2 was given as this. <laughs> Right, that's what that was. The distance is only the denominator there, right? And you're thinking of zero as the position, Paola. Q1 is located at zero, right? It's at the origin, which is the location of it. So again, Q1 is located at zero on the number line, but Q1 had a charge that was given to the problem. Q2 was given a charge. Q3 was given a charge. If the particles don't have a charge, there's no repulsive or attractive force. They're not involved. Mm -hmm. So if I have a three-particle system, but the third one has no charge, then it's really just a two-particle system. Mm -hmm. Is that clear what I'm saying? Yeah. So the zero comes from the position, not the charge. Okay? Yeah? Just to reiterate, so uh, if you ever say magnitude, obviously it is yes or no. It just means absolute value. Because you just want like the total positive force means. From each, I want the yeah. force, correct. And then once you subtract these two, you'll have right or left based on if the answer is positive or negative. Okay? And that was Q3 that was given there. So there's Q3, there's Q2, there's Q1. You'd have to utilize those three values in the actual equations that we're showing there. I will not have you find the force acting on all objects. I'll have you find the force acting on one object. Because if you do the other two, it just takes more time. And tomorrow's a B day. It just it becomes like a 10-minute problem instead of a 5-minute problem suddenly. Okay? I think it's a B day, right? It's a Bex? I think so. Uh, Mr. Mr. Sullivan sent it out, an updated oh, schedule. Uh, sophomore retreat is tomorrow. Remember you guys left it on a B day oh, we early? We do have a B day. Oh, yeah, oh we have the, oh, we have the <laughs>
seniors of the crew. What else? What else do we want to talk about? Helen, Darren, Izzy, go. Okay, just like a short question. Yeah. The only time you multiply 10 to the negative 6 is when it has the like, micro cool just for regular. That's 10 to the negative 6. Yes, yeah, so I think. Oh, I think you said 9, but either way, it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah, no, because I was looking at one of the problems for the textbook that they gave it in, like, regular C, and, like, the first thing I did was yeah. multiply 10 to the negative 6. No, so yeah. If a problem says the charge is 7 coulombs, your Q1 is 7 coulombs. Only when you see the micro symbol do you replace it with 10 in the negative 6. Because literally, if you look, and I'll circle it so it's clear, I'm literally replacing this with this. You see what's physically happening there? Okay. Darren? Um, how do you do number 78? 78. Are we on the same section or no? What section, Darren? Thank you. Thanks, Elias. All right, page 630. Let's take a look at this one. Number 78. All right, I'm going to read it. I'm not going to write the whole problem out. It says, what is the critical angle for total internal reflection for a boundary between a substance 1 with an end value of 1.42? I'm going to draw it. And another substance, N2, with an end value of 1.31. End value of 1.31. Now, it says, in which substance does the total internal reflection occur? First, Darren, what's total internal reflection? That's, that's part of the problem then, clearly, right? Because to know what a critical angle is, we need to know what total internal reflection is. Somebody tell Darren what total internal reflection is. Yeah. Total internal reflection is when, like, um, okay. the boundary is like, Somebody else. <laughs> stop, stop, stop. Uh -huh. Let her think. <laughs> it's fine. Compose yourself, Helen. You, you, I know you know it. Just get the words together for it. I know what like total internal reflection means that like it's like it like basically just like it doesn't transfer it doesn't cross the boundary to the others. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely right. Yeah. Do we know why that happens again? Why is that happening? Because the index of refraction for the first material is greater than the index of refraction for the second material. It's going to reflect off the material that has a greater index of refraction. So we look at this. We see like this is an example. This is say I think one point three one is around water. I think it's water. One point three three. Two and two and two. You can call it R. Call it R. In the book, they called it one and two. Okay. The book calls it one and two. They don't call it I and R. So actually, Paolo, actually, before I say anything, let's not call it R and I yet because R and I matter based on whether they're bigger or smaller. So for now, let's just call them one and two. So this problem says find the critical angle for total internal reflection to occur, and it's only going to ever occur if you go from a higher end to a lower end. That's the only time it ever occurs. Higher end to lower. And if you forget that, think back to the demo that I attempted that didn't work that great. Remember the fish tank with the laser? The laser didn't want to escape the water. It got bent back into the water. That was called total internal reflection. And water has a higher end value than air. What's the end value of air? One. And that's the lowest end value, right? So we already know that the lower the end value, the faster the, op, the, the ray is going to move. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. The faster the ray will move with the, slow, with the lower the end value. So for these problems, we're going to see that happen. So as a result, because, because it has to be going from, again, a higher end value to a lower end value, already I know that this light ray has to start in this medium. Then it's going to hit this interface. It's going to want to travel along the dotted red line. But because it is going to a... I, I just so. I said higher to lower. Switch these two. I'm sorry. I said it right and then I wrote... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. I said it and then I wrote it backwards. Damn it. Wow. So because... I know. It's a lot of like memorization of numbers and stuff. But let me show you something in a minute that might help. I showed the other class and I think it helped them. So... 
because it's going from a larger n to a smaller n, it's going to, as a result, go from a slower to a faster medium. Faster because n is lower. And if I don't remember that, remember that air is 1, lowest n, which is the fastest medium. So the lower the n, the faster it goes. What happens is, when a light ray goes faster, the angle of refraction gets bigger. Mm -hmm. So let's show the actual path of this guy in blue. The actual path it's going to take is this right here. So the incident angle might be a number like, I don't know, 20 degrees. That means that the refracted angle must be greater than 20 degrees. Take a look at the arrangement of what's happening here. Now, if you're having trouble remembering this, which I can understand that, I really could, because I have trouble myself remembering which is which, think about Snell's Law. Let's jot down Snell's Law. Snell's Law tells me Ni sine theta i equals Nr sine theta r. Now, because I've already stated that we're starting in water or this N2, you could call this Ni if you'd like if it helps, and call that Nr. But what do you notice is happening? You're going from, take a look up please, a bigger N to a smaller N. Agreed? You can all mathematically see that? This is bigger, this is smaller. So this must be bigger and this must be smaller for there to be balance. Think back to chemistry, you balanced equations, think of physics, you balance forces. So if this n is very large, which it is, compared to the new n value, bless you, this n goes from being big to small, so theta should go from being small to big. You see how they're opposites, they're inversely related, the n and the theta? So if n gets smaller, theta gets bigger. If n gets bigger, theta gets smaller. Now, hold on one second. What we want for these problems is for theta r to get so big that it's more than 90 and bends back in. And that's total internal reflection. But that will only occur, remember, as this number itself gets bigger. So if I make this 30, this will be greater than 30. If I make this 70, this will be greater than 70. Oh, so, you can make it 90. so if this number, now, if this number is like 50, it might cause this to be more than 90, because these numbers are not going to be identical. So although this says 20, this answer here for theta r could be like 60. So maybe by the time this becomes 35, this gets to 90. Or by the time this gets to 50, this gets to 100 degrees. And 100 degrees would be like that. It would be all the way past 90 and then back in. So there's going to be a point where this angle is big enough to cause this angle to be more than 90. When that point occurs, it's called the critical angle. That's the critical angle. And there's a formula for it that you can use to plug in. And I'll show you in a moment. Yes? When it hits the critical angle, doesn't it run, like, doesn't the light ray run parallel? Yeah. At the critical angle, it's here. Anything more than the critical angle, it's it bends back in. So the critical angle is finding it so that the ray goes like this and refracts just along the surface. But any angle more, so say the critical angle is 22 degrees here, anything more than 22 will bend back in. But at 22, yes, it's along the surface boundary. Surface boundary is that phrase. So let's look at this critical angle mathematically. Mathematically, the critical angle, theta c, is equal to, and you recall I derived this in class. I'm not going to re-derive it, but I did show it in class if you want to see where it comes from. Theta c is going to be the sine inverse. Now let's think about this logically. We're going from a value here of 1.42 to a value here. And I told you already that the smaller number is always going to be on the top of this, right? Remember I mentioned this? Always. So this is NR, isn't it? The second medium, this is NI. So NI is bigger. NI is always in the bottom. NR is always in the top. It's on your formula sheet. You don't have to memorize it. But I want, to, I want you guys to understand where it's really coming from. Okay, so it's going to be NR over NI. And again, this is really NR because it's the refracted medium. This is really NI because it's the incident medium. I stands for incident or initial. Either way. Either way. So to answer your question, Darren, it says find the critical angle for this substance, and which substance does total internal reflection occur in? 
Well, total internal reflection occurs in this substance for sure, because it's not going to be able to escape. It's going to get bent back in. This is Ni, which is 1.42. So the critical angle is going to simply be sine inverse of 1.31 over 1.42, and that'll give you some angle. Okay? You had a question. Sorry. You had the answer? What do you got as a value? So let's talk about what that means. 67.3? Okay. So what does that mean? Here's what it means. When the incident angle reaches 67.3, so I'm going to use green. Take a look at the diagram, please. When the incident angle reaches an angle of 67.3 degrees, the ray will bend perfectly along the surface, and it'll bend so much that the refracted angle will be 90 degrees. Anything more than 67.3 makes this more than 90. That's why we call it critical. It's a threshold. Anything more than 67.3 makes this like 100, which bends back in. So that's, uh, the, what are you saying, the total reflection? Total internal reflection occurs when theta i is greater than theta c. When our incident angle is more than the critical angle, we get total internal reflection. When it's at the critical angle, you can still call it total internal reflection, but know that it's along the surface boundary. It's not bent back in. And are you going to give us a problem where it's uh, a, a smaller number to a bigger number? It never occurs, though. Remember, when it goes from smaller to bigger, it bends toward the normal. Mm -hmm. So this will get smaller and smaller as a theta r. So if I go from a low medium, a low end value to high end value, the Theta r will keep getting smaller. It's impossible for it to occur. And if you try it, if you try it with a bigger and smaller, you'll get a syntax error in your calculator because you literally can't. It's not calculable. It's calculable. Is. You sure? Yeah. Okay. All right. Great question. Great question. Uh, after Darren, well, you had a question though. Is that you, you figured it out from earlier? Is? Yeah. Because it was gonna be Helen, Darren, you. You got it. Oh. Before. Yeah, it was a different question. All right, cool. That's fine. Um, what else? Want to go through a list of formulas? Oh, yeah. Uh, Seventy-four on page five fifty-eight. Page five five eight. Yeah. To tomorrow. Yeah. Um, okay. I need to do with their problem sets. I'll go back. Page five fifty-eight, number seventy-four. The UV radiation? Yeah. Okay. It says ultraviolet light is typically divided into three categories, UVA, UVB, UVC. We're told that they have different wavelengths for each one. So UVA extends from 400 nanometers to 320. And this is UV... Oops. UVA waves. Next, we're also told that UVB has a min and a max. What is that? 320 to 280. And then finally, UVC is... Be thank you. 100 to 280? 280. 280. Oh, I'm going min to max, though. Oh, yeah. Right? Why would I switch them? So each of these have a minimum wavelength and a maximum wavelength. And the questions say, find the range of frequency for UVB. Well, UVB has a min wavelength there and a max wavelength there. What speed do all EM waves travel at? Speed of light. So although my formula for this is V equals lambda frequency, at first, it's like, oh, I only have lambda. How could I get frequency? But you also have V. V is C. V is C. So this is 3 times 10 to the 8 equals lambda, which is 280 nano, so times 10 to the negative 9 meters, times the frequency. And then I can do the problem again and use the larger value. 
can find the frequency. And remember, 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 the larger wavelength will give me Good. Smaller frequency. And a smaller wavelength, obviously now, gives you a bigger frequency. Okay? So you got F max twice, F max and F min, and that's the range of frequencies for UVB. And then it says, in which of these three categories does radiation with a frequency of this amount occur? Pretty much find the range for each of those for frequencies and see which one it falls into. Does that answer your question? You sure? Yep. Okay. All right. Any other problem set questions or homework questions or just general questions before I do some formula stuff? Okay, let's look at our formulas. Just generally speaking, um, the table we have of the different... Um, N? No, no, the table with the different uh, wavelengths of like in order. You don't have to memorize all those numbers, definitely not. Uh, yeah, but you should know like some of the applications of it, yeah. whether I give it as a multiple choice questions or a short answer. You should be able to look at that and see the applications of some of yeah. them. And the general trend, I mean, like, it goes from radio waves all the way down to, like, gamma, right? Yeah. And it goes from high wavelength to very low wavelength. So it goes from very low frequency to very high frequency. So the trend of the frequency and wavelength you should be able to pick up on. But I'm not going to be nitpicking, be like, you know, what wavelength occurs at, or what type of wave is it if it's 2.7 nanometers. I'd give you the table and you have to find it. I would make you solve a problem get the frequency at the end of the problem, and then say, which wave is this? And you would have a table to associate with it. Yeah. Kind of like the n values are given in tables, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same idea. Maybe you find an n value. Have, have you guys at least looked at that lab? I know it's not due to after break, but have some of you looked at it yet? No. If you have, you'll notice, I would recommend just looking at it tonight. Really look at it tonight. It will help for the test tomorrow really well. Um, in that lab, you'll notice there's a mystery material, and you have to <sighs> determine n in that problem, and then match it up to a table of n values to know, is it glass, is it water, is it diamond, is it air, what is it, okay? okay. All right, you're welcome. Three sets of formulas. First, this is 15, 2, 16, 1, 17, and 19. 19 is most recent, we can do that, that's an easy one. Here's your one formula. And we already went over this. A couple of you asked the question on it. But there's the one formula for 19. That's it. Remember, I talked about how that's analogous to this. But this is not a formula from chapter 19. They are analogous, but this is not a chapter 19 formula. Is that clear what I'm saying? Okay. Next. Absolutely. You should be able to solve for any variable in any formula ever given. Solving for R is easy. Switch R squared with FE. That's it. KQ1, Q2 over FE. Mm -hmm. 15, 2, 16, 1, we had one formula. But because it's EM waves, we said that V is really the speed of light. So I could replace that with C. C stands for speed of light, and that's on your formula sheet. Now, technically, if I give you a problem on this test and have you find frequency, I could say find the period. Probably won't, but you should know that period is 1 over frequency. Another formula on your formula sheet. Chapter 17, all we used was Snell's Law. Oh, no, that's not true. We started with this. Then we went into Snell's Law and the critical angle. What's V saying? I'll go over that, yeah. Yes, R over I, right? Yeah, R over I. Okay. What is V in that first formula? What is V in that first formula? Good. The speed of the light. N equals C over Yeah, the first, sorry. Oh, I said first formula. No, I meant this one, sorry. In the first formula in chapter 17, this V stands for the velocity speed of the wave in the medium. So if it's glass, and you know the speed of light in glass, you can plug that in, and then divide that into the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8, and you can get the end value for glass. Will that be given? Like Formula? The speed of light in glass? Yeah, I would have to give you that as okay. a statement. So a problem could start. Ready? The speed of light in water is blank. As soon as I give you the speed of light in water, you can find the end value for water. And then later in the problem, I'm going to say, determine the index of refraction or the angle 
theta, you'd have to use the n value calculating part a. So there's a good chance, there's a good chance at the beginning of the problem, I give you the speed of light in water that goes here. You put 3 times 10 to the 8 here. That'll give you the n value for water. And then you'll use the n value for water in Snell's law for part b. Like a two-part problem, two-part problem. Part a, you find the n value using this. Part b, you find the angle using this. And maybe part c, I say, ooh, find the critical angle too, a, b, c. But it's not gonna, it's not meant to trick you, these problems. They're gonna be very straightforward in chapter 17. So those C's aren't the same, right? That's speed of light and that's... They're both that speed of light. So three times the speed of light. Is what C is, but remember, V is the speed of light in the new material. Doesn't it slow down the new material? So that's a different value. So three times 10 over the 8. 10 to the 8. 10 to the 8, something. Three times, it's not the same. Uh, it's not? You said three times 10 over the 8th power. 3 times 10 to the 8th power over whatever the speed of that material gives light. So glass, diamond, water, that's going to vary depending on what the medium is. But it has to be above 1 pretty much. But n will always be above 1, yeah. correct, because the numerator is always going to be greater than the denominator. Everybody get that piece that Brendan just added? Why is n always greater than 1 besides Brendan who just talked about it? Why is the n value always greater than 1, Darren? Because 1 is there and that's the only thing. Okay, mathematically, why is the n value always... You're right. Mathematically, why is the n value always greater than 1? The speed of light always has to... Well, c always has to be... The numerator always has to be greater because nothing's faster than the speed of light. Correct. c is the fastest possible speed we can achieve, the speed of light in a vacuum. So c is always going to be bigger than whatever the speed of light is in the new medium. So if it's in glass, it slows down. That means that V will be less than C. So you have a big number over a smaller number. Therefore, it's always greater than 1. Always greater than 1. That's it for my formulas. I've got so many. What else you want to ask? What else you want to go over? Got about five minutes, guys. Five minutes. Help me out if you want to ask something else. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. I mean, like, I, I think I get it, but like, doesn't it only work with plastic cones, not with like a metal cone? Yeah. Let's talk about why that is. So, chapter nineteen, <laughs> theoretical stuff. So Elias brings up the question of why a metal comb doesn't give a lot of static electric charge whereas a plastic one does. Metal is a? Plastic is a? Indicator. What is it? Insulator. 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 That's all right. Now, here's what happens. If I rub a comb through my hair, the electrons jump from my hair to the comb. The problem is if the comb's made out of metal, it goes right to the comb, through the comb, back into my body, back into the earth. <laughs> so the comb doesn't hold that static charge when it's made out of metal, whereas when it's plastic, it can. Now, theory behind this, let's go into this idea. My hair, here's my full head of hair here, and there's a person, and there's the comb right there with all the teeth on the comb. If the comb gains electrons, that means your hair must be positively charged Right? Because if the comb gains negative charge, the hair might gain positive. How is that possible? How can, the comb, how can your hair gain a positive charge? How can your hair gain a positive charge? That's my question. How can your hair gain a positive charge? There's two ways. You're thinking of the, the polarization with the balloon and the wall? Yeah. And that is theoretically like it, but that's not what I'm asking here. But give me a sec, because I'm going to talk about that is. Oh. How can your hair gain a positive charge? Come on. I don't know. You know what? Pass. I don't know. The transfer? Of? Thank you. A transfer of electrons. What I want to point out is what are you not transferring? Protons. Protons are never gained or lost. They're in the nucleus. 
Electrons are valence. They're on the outer shells. They move very easily, very readily. So a gain of positive charge really comes from a loss of electrons. Mm. Write that down because none of you had that answer except for Izzy. A gain of positive charge comes from a loss of electrons. A gain of negative charge comes from a gain of electrons. Can you say that one more time? I know that, but like, what, how does that question, how am I supposed to know that the question wants that answer? That's not the question. I, I'm done with that. I, asked, I answered the question already. I'm just talking about other theory. That's exactly what he said. He asked about why a metal comb doesn't work, and I already answered that. This is totally different. Okay, but what you said, I know, but I didn't know the answer to what you said and Izzy answered. When I read this question, I because protons can't move. That's the answer. Electrons have to move. So if I'm, right, if I gain a negative charge, it means electrons... I'm not going to do it and say yeah, like from this, right? Yeah. Electrons yeah. jump from here to my body to give me gain a negative charge. So the electrons jump from here to my body. So this is missing electrons now, right? Yeah. If it's missing electrons, it must have more protons, protons than electrons. So it's got oh, wow. a positive charge. What is neutral? What is neutral? Neutrons. Yeah. Neutral means you have the same amount of protons as electrons. So if you suddenly lose electrons, you're no longer neutral. You're losing a negative charge. So now you have an abundance of positive charge, and that's what's happening to this person's hair. So when you bring the comb near the hair, after you've done it, you could do it with Joe's hair right now. It'd be pretty, pretty good, actually. It'd be good. You bring that comb near the person's hair, that person's hair is going to get attracted because... Opposites attract. Opposites attract. Ooh. Opposites attract. Wait, so how do you know? <laughs> Think about your question before you ask it. I'm saying think about the wording of it because you're having trouble wording the question. So how are you supposed to know if it has a Mr. Howell. I'm just asking for I have a free, but I have a meeting in 15 minutes. And never mind. You can hang out and ask me something else. No, it was about uh, the room. Oh, no, I can't visualize right now, guys. I don't mean, have more 45. What do you mean? Zero has more electrons. It means that there's an abundance of negative charge. So that's our negative comes from. Now, you can't have more protons suddenly. So really, what happens is if I want to be positive, I lose negative instead. So by giving you my electrons, you become negative. And I, because I lost electrons, become positive. It's just the balance of electrons only. But you're never going to lose or gain protons, is what I'm saying. It's just the electrons that are transferred between two bodies. Yeah, I already did my job.